Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show and happy Friday. We made it. What a week. All right, it's been crazy. We thank you all, by the way, for turning to our show. When there is big news, we're glad to have a growing number of you who are listening to this podcast and finding us on YouTube, youtube.com slash Megan Kelly. Help us out, subscribe, and get us over that million dollar mark. It's not dollars, it's viewers. Um, a million dollars would be nice too, but a million viewers is really our goal. Because, you know, my pal Piers Morgan, he got over a million subscribers and they gave him a fun little button. <laughs> I would like the fun button. Uh, also, my children would think it was cool. Uh, we are live on Sirius XM Triumph Channel 111 every weekday at noon as well, if you care to listen to the show that way. We've got a couple of personal stories to bring you next hour. But first, uh, we are talking all the big news in the country with our pal, Buck Sexton, co-host of The Clay Travis and Buck Sexton Show. Hey, subscribe to the show on YouTube and follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Look, you did the tough thing during COVID. You paid your people and pulled your business through the pandemic. And now doing the tough thing could qualify you for up to $26,000 per employee at covidtaxrelief.org. Government funds are available right now to reward companies with two or more employees who stayed open during COVID. It's not a loan. You don't have to pay it back. The program's a little complicated, but no one knows more about it than the CPAs and tax pros at covidtaxrelief.org. You pay nothing up front. They do all the work, then share a percentage of the cash they get you. Businesses of all types, including nonprofits and churches, can qualify, even those who took PPP loans and even if you had increases in sales. You did the tough thing for your employees during COVID. Let covidtaxrelief.org help get you up to $26,000 per employee. Visit covidtaxrelief.org, covidtaxrelief.org, covidtaxrelief.org. Buck, great to have you back. How you doing? I'm good, Megan. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, our pleasure. All right. So I just looked at the Fox News ratings in the 8 p.m. time slot from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We don't have Thursday yet because they come out at 420 uh, every day. So we'll get those at 420 today. And just a couple of the terms that came to mind, um, massacre, bloodbath, murder, uh, devastation. The audience is gone. They left. There's virtually no one there at 8 p.m. anymore. Just as bad as I'm sure Fox News worried it would get, it's far worse than that. I tweeted out yesterday they lost, lost half their audience. It's worse than that. They've, they've lost almost two-thirds of their audience in the 8 p.m time slot. It's total devastation. I'm going to give you the latest numbers. Um, on Monday, Kill Me got 2.6 million in the overall. Tucker had been getting 3.2 the previous uh, Monday. Kill Me got 294,000 in the key audience demo of 25 to 54 year olds. The previous Monday, Tucker had 445. Tuesday, it got worse. Um, Kill Me got 1.7 million viewers. Tucker's previous Tuesday, 3.2 million. 3.2. Uh, in the key demo on Tuesday, the 8 p.m. got 149,000 in the key demo. 149,000. Tucker, the previous week, had almost 500,000. He had 481. I mean, we're talking about, what, 330,000 loss in the key demo? That's the one they use to run advertising dollars. That's the one they care about. He, he lost. He lost in the demo to CNN and MSNBC. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen at 8 p.m. on the Fox News channel. Trust me, I was there for almost 20 years. On Wednesday uh, at 8 p.m., this is just shocking to me. They got 1.33 million. That was below the 7 p.m., below the 6 p.m. And compare it with Tucker's the previous week of 3 million. 3 million down to 1.3 million in a week's time. I just, I, like, it's absolutely stunning. In the key demo, the previous week, Tucker had gotten 357,000 in the key audience demo. The 8 p.m. now, 124,000. 124 down from almost 400,000. They lost again to CNN and MSNBC. The 8 p.m. is now losing to Anderson Cooper and Chris Hayes. It doesn't happen. It's never, it doesn't happen unless somebody else has got, like, live video of an earthquake in process or a car chase in process. That's the only way progress. 
that, that the other channels beat Fox. And yet it's happening now. I want to tell you something. Fox News is in a downward spiral that they're going to have to claw to get themselves out of. Just by way of context, right? These numbers overall are so dreadful. We went back and looked back um, at when I was number one in the key audience demo when I was at nine uh, hosting on Fox News. You know what my demo was in October uh, right before I left? 641,000. That's what I was getting in the key audience demo. 641,000. They are down at 124,000 right now at the 8 p.m. And this is an existential crisis for the channel in its prime time, which is how they make money. Don't get me wrong. Daytime's nice for news development. You got to keep something on the air. They live off of their prime time. And the food has dried up. Your reaction? Look, I think that this is the first time that um, Fox is having to deal with an audience that because of the way uh, a host has has exited in this case, feels um, like their best interests are not being taken into account, right? I, I think that this is the first time that you've seen, I mean, with the O'Reilly situation, I think it was very different. Um, you know, your situation was very different. And everyone that I talked to on this issue it says kind of the same thing, which is one, we have no explanation for like no official explanation. I know there's all these different news stories about it, um, but it feels like this was a, a decision that came very suddenly and that the audience wasn't really a factor. And I think when you break that bond with the people who are supposed to be watching, consuming your content, and when all of a sudden it feels like decisions are being made that are not in their best interests, um, uh, but actually some kind of personality conflict maybe at the top of the organization. Uh, that's that's a huge challenge. Also, Tucker gave legitimacy to much of the rest of the Fox primetime lineup, I think, in terms of being willing to, he was the guy who was willing to run into uh, issues uh, that were, you know, too hot to handle. I mean, he was the guy who was willing to actually, I think, push the envelope and that meant that there are people like me. I used to watch Tucker every night. Like, I'll, I'll say that openly. I would watch his monologue. Um, I do three hours of radio a day. Some days I'll do an additional podcast, right? Megan, you know what it's like. I'll do many hours of my own content. I have almost no time to consume anyone else's content. But Tucker's monologue, I would make a point uh, to, to watch it when I could. And now that's not even on my radar anymore. So people like me, for example, we're not going to get there early and maybe catch more of Jesse's show. We're not going to get there later or stay later and and you know watch more of Sean's show. Fox has just fallen off of our radar. If you were if you were coming for Tucker's monologue, now your reason for turning on that primetime channel is uh, that, that channel at primetime feels like it's faded away. I don't know how they can turn this around. I, look, I, I think they have to bring Tucker back, quite honestly. That's where I, I don't know what they think is going to happen here. That would be the you smart know, move. I, right. I mean, I, I think that's what has to happen here because, first of all, I mean, you know, Brian killed me. You, you know, Brian. Brian is a super nice guy. And he I is love being Brian. Pushed. I feel, I know. Brian is such a good dude and he's being put in such a tough spot here. It's not and his I, fault. I, no, right. Oh, it's totally, not. It's like they totally. found their most likable personality and put him in the spot sort of saying, you'll watch Brian, right? You like Brian? This isn't about Brian. This is the audience with the double barrel middle finger saying, you can F right off Fox News. We don't care who you put there. Where's Tucker? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you just from, from my own experience, right? Um, stepping in for... There, there are really, two, you know, there, there's prime time at Fox and there's being on one of like the big four radio shows. But really the biggest, obviously, was was Rush Limbaugh for, for over 30 years. And and when Rush passed, there was this understanding with the audience that they're again, what I was saying before about their interests, that relationship, that bond that Rush had with that audience was so respected, was so respected by um, by Premier, um, by iHeart. Uh, and just just everybody involved that the decision was made, look, we're just going to have people come. We're doing effectively a tribute to Rush. They did a tribute to Rush, pull, pulling his some, you know, some of his best stuff for months, for months. And that was done. In, that was done intentionally just to say, look, we're we want all of you to know that Rush was the greatest that's ever done this. And and then the the decision came along. People said, well, why is it like the Clay and Buck show? Why are there two of you? I mean, the joke I always make is that Rush's shoes were too big to fill so that they put, you know, Clay in one shoe and me in the other, and oh. you know we're we're running as fast as we can in it. And I think the audience knows that we have that level of respect for Russia and what he did. But what I'm saying is that there was this 
this real plan to transition and this understanding of no one's filling Russia's shoes, but we're going to try to serve this audience anyway. So that audience felt respected. Megan, right now, the 8 p.m. Fox audience, and I know because I'm one of them and I, and I talk to so many people who are, they feel disrespected. They're like, well, what do you mean you're taking our guy off the air? For what? They haven't even told anybody for what yet. I think they have to bring Tucker back. I think short of that, this is not a... Uh, this is not an issue that can be can be easily fixed. And you know, when when there were when you departed, Bill departed, there was the Trump wave that happened, right? The Trump he phenomenon. Yeah. It, the Trump phenomenon. I mean, I mean, honestly, all you had to do was sort of get on TV and cover Trump and be like, wow, this is kind of an amazing political reality we've got here. And it was yeah. just like boom, right? That's not there anymore. And it's not going to be there even if Trump, I think, wins the primary because it's just a different attitude and a different time. So I, I think that I, for the first time, Fox to me is in an existential crisis when it comes to viewers. I've and I've been watching Fox since I was in high school. I agree with you one hundred percent. I I used to laugh that those big numbers I was getting at nine, I was very proud of them. I got those during the Obama years, the Obama years, Buck. <laughs> okay, you, it you wasn't during this... the Trump Cup runneth over years. It was yeah. hard to put points on the board back then. The man was nine times out of 10, quite boring. Not as boring as Joe Biden, but he was a bore compared to Trump. But in any event, they so you're right. Not only do they is Trump not going to be quite as exciting this time around, even if he gets it, but Fox has turned on Trump. Maybe the Murdochs will eventually say, okay, we'll submit and we'll go along with him if he becomes the GOP nominee. But very clearly, they've turned on him. Take one look at the Wall Street Journal or the New York Post or Fox's editorial. They, they've turned on Trump and the message has come down. So they're not going to be taking the Trump pressers and, you know, his rallies in the way they did in 15, 16. So they don't have that magic card to play. They actually have to earn it. And what they have right now is a broken trust with the audience who they helped introduce to Tucker, who they made love Tucker. Tucker did it on his own, but I'm just saying they gave Tucker the opportunity and he hit it out of the park, he and his team. And then they yanked the rug right out from under them, from, from under Tucker, from under Justin Wells, his producer, from under the audience, as you point out, with zero attempt to even tell the audience why. You know, with me, it was different. I left voluntarily. The audience understood that. Okay, she wants to do something else. With Bill, it was different. Okay, he paid out 69 million bucks in sexual harassment settlements. That's not going to fly in the Me Too era. We get it. We don't like it, but he's got to go. We get it. They're not going to hold that against Fox. There's been nothing. Not, and I get from an HR perspective, Buck, how you, you, know, you don't want to say much just in case you get sued. This is well beyond that. This is well beyond that. They must give an explanation. And instead, what they're doing is just leaking a different smear every day. You know, we talked about yesterday how in the New York Times it was, oh, you know, we've been provided with, we, we've gotten our hands on a videotape showing Tucker referring to some random woman as yummy. Um, talking about his, quote, post-menopausal audience and whether they'll like the way he looks. I'm telling you, that's Fox calling through his commercial breaks while he's sitting there making small talk with his staff, um, pulling stupid comments. None of those would reflect well on any of us if they did that. Like, your, your adrenaline's flowing, you're passing the time. What? It's ridiculous. That's how they're trying to take him down without just telling us, why'd you do this? Well, yeah, and I think that, you know, um, Fox is in a really difficult position here because they're setting a standard now. So, so you know, for you are, are are an exception in this regard, and and I mean that. And you know, there are some others too where you can really say what you want, and there's not some concern that you're going to get you know booted, right? I mean, you know, yeah. within reason. Um, I think a lot of us who do this for a living and are trying to, you know, I mean, I'm I'm saying things on on radio on a regular basis that I think are pushing the envelope. I don't think I'm crossing any lines. But when the 8 p.m. at Fox just gets tossed like this, and again, without, and by the way, Bill, you know, Bill was on on TV and did this. The Bill, Bill got 20 years, right? Like Bill mm -hmm. wasn't somebody who it wasn't, it didn't feel like his run was cut short or in the same way. Um, you know, Bill might disagree with that, and I don't mean that, you know, disrespectfully. I just mean, you know, he he got a good run at Fox. He Tucker had been doing this for what six years in the 8 p.m. But it feels like to all the rest of us, how and Tucker's can we a young believe, man. You know, yeah, with all Fox, due respect to O'Reilly, O'Reilly was, you know, I think 70 when he got pushed out. Tucker's 53. Right. Well, that's that's what I mean. It's, it's just a different, yeah. you know, when a player, when the captain of the team who's you know been to 
you know, 10, you know, 10 or 15 all-star games or something, you know, moves to a different league. That's one thing. When the guy who feels like he's in his uh, just sort of hitting his professional stride and just sort of touching on some of these issues that uh, or opening up some of these issues that I think Tucker was doing a really masterful job of that, that feels very different to the audience. So there's, there's a lot of, of, of complications for this. And I think that for people who would like to believe that conservative media has, I mean, I, I refer to like our, our radio show, for example, because, you know, in all honesty, and Clay says this all the time. So I'll say this too. Like we have phenomenal, we have phenomenal bosses. Like we're lucky. I'm never told what to say. They back me up. And as long as I'm sort of staying within the principles of who I am and, and you know, what I do, I know that I'm, I'm supported, but Fox, we, I, I used to say that our, our show is like an unsinkable battleship of free speech, right? Now, nothing's truly unsinkable if it's out in the water, but you get the idea. For the 8 p.m. to go down like this, I think the, the reverberations, and one of the reasons this is so upsetting to people is, okay, well, if Tucker can't talk about maybe the GOP's going astray on corporatism or the war on Ukraine or uh, or big pharma donor money or whatever it may be, if he can't get away with that, and whether that was why there was any pressure on him or not, that's a whole other discussion. But it feels like none of us really can, right? I mean, this is, you're the 8 p.m. at Fox, you're the tent pole of that network, and you get summarily dismissed without real explanation. Everybody else in this business feels like, how long before there's some corporate pressure that gets me booted? Do you, do you know what I mean? It, it, mm -hmm. it's, it feels like a shot that affects the psychology, I think, of a lot of people who are trying to shed light on on troubling issues. And and, yeah. and also, look, you know, Tucker was he was kind of blocking and tackling for a lot of people to follow in and 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 to say these things and to ask these questions. Um, so with that gone, there's a piece of the movement that feels like has been taken out. So it's even bigger well, here's the in other my thing, mind. Bob. Here's the other thing. The What's you, you mentioned you and Clay, right? You're you're crushing it in radio. Um, Thanks. the digital lane has got, you know, so many great voices from Ben Shapiro, Joe Rogan, of course, is one. I'm over here, Glenn. There are so many people to choose from now if you are in the center, center right or right. So many people. Dan Bongino, who they fired, um, so many great choices. You don't need Fox anymore. They are not the monopoly in conservative media that they used to be. They're just not. And so you take away the unique voice, the one thing that really is different over there, Tucker's different. He just comes at things from different angles. What's the reason? What, why do I need to tune in to Fox News in the evening now? Now I can be with my family. Now I can listen to a show that I've downloaded on my show, uh, on, my, on my phone. Like they're taking yeah. away the, the one unique, truly unique draw they had. I, I think... Uh, also, you know, you know this from coming up with with rundowns night in and night out on cable and, and now on this show, but you could tune in and look, I, you know, Sean Hannity has always been amazing to me and and he's, you know, one of the most successful people in this medium of, of all time. Um, and so no, no, nothing but but love for him and, and Jesse Waters, who's now stepped into the seven o'clock. But, you know, you kind of generally know with those shows, I feel like you kind of know what you're getting a little bit where you're going to have i i knew what the i knew what the top story was going to be on those shows anytime that i tuned in right i mean that's and of that's course. not a knock it's just you know you're kind of this is what this is kind of where the republican media focus is today with tucker sometimes he'd start the show and you're like wait what are we what are we talking about today you know it, it was yeah and that sense of both you know of adventure and discovery that you had from tuning into that monologue was to your point very unique and and I think it was a whole draw it was a draw but also it it made people stay around more for other things and it also made it feel like the rest of you know the if you think of the primetime network I mean or the primetime shows as almost like a team right there was always at least one guy on the team who was really uh who was really throwing punches you know what I mean who was who was taking mm -hmm. shots at the other side and everyone was kind of playing their playing their role, I think. Um, and and now without that, it's like, well, I can get a lot of this. The media landscape has changed dramatically since the beginning of the Trump era. You know, there were those huge changes, right? Obviously, Els is pushed out, passes uh, passes away. Um, you know, you and and uh, and O'Reilly leave, but then you had the Trump phenomenon. But you also now have so many more ways. I mean, look, I was watching. I watch Fox on YouTube TV. And I, I wasn't watching. I don't own. I don't uh, have a cable box. I don't subscribe to cable. Uh, and I'm 41, so I'm kind of maybe in the you know that 
era where people are just my age or are switching and becoming more and more cord cutters, um, content on demand and content from people that are really trying to serve the audience has gotten better as an experience and more varied overall across the whole landscape. And content creators have more leverage, as you know, right? I mean, yeah. you know, you're sitting here as a perfect example of somebody who gets to do what she wants to do on her show, and you'll partner with established uh, platforms and brands and things. But that's all. It's a whole different world now, and I feel like Fox, in a, in just a a business sense, maybe maybe learning that. Uh, so I mean, that, why would you cut ties with your one unicorn at a time when people are cord cutting? Digital media is on the rise. It's so user friendly. If you want to listen to me, to you guys, to Ben, you can do it whenever you want. You don't have to tune in and sit in front of your your cable box at nine p.m. or whatever the time. You know, it's just. It, it doesn't make any business sense. And we still don't know the reason. That's why people speculate. Was it his ideology? Was it the fact that he pushed back against elites uh, like the people who run Fox? You know, what, what was it the fact that he was too open to the MAGA base? Uh, could that have been it since they've turned on MAGA over there to some extent? Uh, the, I, I had one reliable person tell me it's because something in those text messages is negative about the Murdochs. Please tell me they're that thin-skinned. Please tell me they're not that thin-skinned. <laughs> that uh, an employee venting about them in a private message never meant to be seen by them would lead them to fire the guy. I'll tell you right now to my staff right now, if you're out there and you have negative texts about me because I've been a bitch one day, you know, privately, you go for it. People need to vent. <laughs> it's like getting mad at your kid because he said to his, his sibling, God, she's a nightmare after you yell at them. Like people need to vent. If that's what it is, it's actually totally absurd. And I can see why they're embarrassed about it and they want to pin it on 10 other different things. Um, I don't know. Can I say this, though, just to move it forward? Of course, the left is reveling in this. Okay, they're reveling in the fact that that Tucker, in particular, was fired because they hated him. And th that cues up Jimmy Kimmel just perfectly. I'm sorry to have to put you through this, but here's just uh -oh. a bit, I know, of Jimmy Kimmel reacting to Tucker's video. We put out a video two days ago, didn't address the Fox situation directly, but talked about how we're all run by elites now, and there are no more even two parties. It's really one party rule in America. Those who are in the elite cabal and those who are not, and they will decide what gets to be discussed and talked about. And if you color outside the lines, you'll be punished. So it's pretty, you know, not so veiled message, I think, about why he thinks he got the boot. Um, and here's Jimmy Kimmel reacting. These texts were said to be so offensive, Fox didn't know whether to fire Carlson or to give him another hour on prime time. It's easy to forget how much Tucker Carlson has accomplished over his career. You know, he's been fired by Fox, CNN, MSNBC, and PBS. That's like the EGOT of cable news. But punks of scrawny Phil emerged from his hole last night with a video message addressing his fans. Wait until you hear about this guy named Tucker Carlson. You are gonna hate him. Man Boob should be the name of his next show. This video, I don't know, it looks like he made it while waiting for a table at the Cracker Barrel. As long as you can hear the words, there is hope. <laughs> oh my goodness, even his hair was a lie. Okay. You know how much it costs to produce Jimmy Kimmel's show? I guarantee you it's tens and tens of millions. It could be as much as a hundred million. I have no idea. But it's tens of millions of dollars to produce that show. Um, you know how much Tucker's video cost? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. You know how much Jimmy Kimmel, how many people he gets tuning in on an average night? Um, just last week, his average was in the overall, meaning all viewers, 1.5 million. In the key demo, 236,000. Tucker would have been embarrassed to pull that on any night he was on the Fox News channel. That, that's what they're getting now with the APM that nobody's watching. T Tucker's numbers were three times the, what Jimmy Kimmel gets. And Tucker's little basement video that he did from clearly like his cabin that he broadcasts out of Maine in. Um, literally has 21 million views. Okay, 21 million views. Whereas, as I point out, on ABC, a massive network that comes into your home for free that you have to make no effort to find, at best, Jimmy Kimmel can get 1.5 million. So this guy, he needs to have a little self-perspective before going out there and hurling these insults because he looks a little silly. Well, yeah, and and I think look, there's there's a couple things here, right? There's uh, on the one hand, um, there's obviously the jealousy, which I think you're you're getting at, which is that Tucker Carlson 
is able to was able to create such a now granted fox is a great platform and we, we would all admit that but he became even a phenomenon within that within that realm and and became such a big part of the national conversation i mean jimmy kimmel is an unfunny comedian who was handed a big break and instead of actually using a really phenomenal opportunity to entertain people to bring people together and make them laugh he became a low iq political hack who also makes jokes sometimes and it's kind of sad to watch but that's what the guy who used to be you know running around asking women inappropriate questions on the man show has become it's not funny i mean i've i've tried occasionally to watch that i'm just like what happened to the late night comedy shows by the way greg gutfeld's show crushing those shows and i think it's because uh well a, a number of reasons one of them is that greg actually tries to be funny more than to please the uh, political corporate masters that are demanding, you know, constant attacks on Trump or something like that. So there's the vanity component of it, which, you know, is very common in, in media. Um, and, and also, I just think that there's, uh, uh, you know, there, well, there's that, that you could say is actually jealousy. And then we can go to the vanity of they hate Tucker because he made fun of them. That's a big part of all of this as well. Um, Tucker was able to laugh at the elites and laugh at silly people in the media who are generally very overpaid deeply unimpressive lack gratitude for the fact that they and i you know you go the women of the view the late night uh you know comedian shows like these are people every host at msnbc these are people who are entirely replaceable who are nasty and often lead very sad and, and selfish lives um and certainly aren't doing anything i think to benefit any political conversation in the country it's just the most hackneyed talking points you could ever find and instead of being grateful for the fact that they're paid these salaries and given these opportunities it's like they just become increasingly bitter um and they have no sense of humor about themselves at all you'll notice and this is true of all totalitarians by the way but it's certainly true of the what we used to call the mainstream media we didn't even call, you know, notice that megan that that term faded away and i think it's because they're not the mainstream media really anymore because the media has expanded so much and changed so much so it's really a misnomer to call them the msm um i sometimes will call them democrat democrat corporate media or you know leftist corporate media or whatever uh, but i really do think that they you'll know they hate tucker right i mean you know they, they might have, i'm sure they were taking shots at you when you when you left uh fox um but they hate tucker in this literally like visceral way because he would openly and with his tucker laugh mock them and that's the that is the sin that they shall never forgive so it's it's weirdly personal for all of the people who are making these uh these comments on tv about tucker now that hate him so much it is. and uh, i think that's just a testament to his effectiveness but we need more people that will mock these clowns the even the bit at the end where they for the listening audience there's a the, kimmel ended that bit by pulling off what he was suggesting was a toupee off of tucker and showing a bald head tucker's hair is 100 percent real and it just hair. it shows it, he does have great hair, but it just shows Kimmel's bitterness, his jealousy. What do you, you don't do that. Like you can make fun of Tucker however you want, but like, why go personal? Why do that? Like, because he's jealous. It's coming out of his nostrils. He can't stand his success. He's reveling in the fact that Tucker's been pulled from Fox News and talk about short-sighted, you know, you just wait. You just wait until Tucker resurfaces. He will crush your numbers again. And you'll be just as bitter as you are now with just as few people watching. It's only a matter of time before this guy, Seth Meyers, gets pulled from the air. The only reason that they still have their hours, notwithstanding these dreadful ratings, is because they're, they're still the hangover from Trump. They did their duty during Trump. They changed from comedy into political assassins. And there was a market from that. But at some point, the, these businesses need yeah. to make money and it's not happening I, with Jimmy Kimmel. I think I think that those late night political shows, it really, it was, it was actually sad. I mean, yeah, it's pathetic, but it's sad because for comedians, it's like they're making, you know, hostage proof of life videos every night, you know? Yeah. Comedians right. are supposed to be pushing boundaries, you know, smashing sacred cows, you know, doing things that um are are on that edge and they became they became really like the conformist political stasi you know they were the ones that were the same tired trump jokes every night the same bs jokes about you know republicans and guns and and bibles and all this stuff and it just was increasingly pathetic and i think that for comedians in particular 
You know, I, I think that there was a time when someone like uh, Jimmy Kimmel was trying to be funny, like in, back in the day with Corolla on the Man Show, yeah, um, things like that. I, I think that you know he he was a comedian. He's not a comedian anymore. So I think that there's uh, a sense from some of them of of like tremendous resentment at their present circumstances because they don't want to admit that they've essentially uh, betrayed their craft. I mean, they have given up what they're supposed to really be, which is a source of levity, entertainment, and even insight uh, as comedians. And instead, they just became, as you said, uh, political hitmen. And Same, and it's, same for it's John pathetic. Stewart. You know, he, he used to uh, be acerbic, yeah. but he used to make people laugh. Now he's just a nasty Bitter guy who hates yeah. everybody who doesn't share his own worldview. Okay, and he's not. I guess he's there's not a, a market, a, very small market for that. But good luck. Yeah, you know, like making making jokes and everything else back in the day was something that he could do pretty well. He's not as smart as he thinks he is. A lot of these comedians yeah. they get used to having a big audience and a lot of influence because of the jokes. But if you're really going to play with the big boys, that was the thing about Stewart that even in his heyday, I always found very a uh, little bit off putting. Like I watched I watched the show, so I was somebody who. You know, I thought that the John Stewart show when I was in college was funny, uh, The Daily Show. Um, but there was, a, I think Kevin Williamson of National Review called it once clown nose on, clown nose off. Yeah, where, of course. You know, it's of all ha ha jokes, jokes. And then, and then it's like, well, let's talk about why you're in climate denial. And you're like, climate denial? Are you a lunatic? Like, do you really think the world's going to end? It's like, oh, I'm just a comedian, you know? I just make the ha ha. That's the part of it that always sort of. But at least you know. back then he could bring you the ha ha every once in a while. No, now he was good at the ha ha. Now he's, now good he's like an angry man who is like completely racist against white people who don't share the Black Lives Matter by all this stuff. You know, it's like he's become yeah. one of those totally woke activist liberals who thinks we need to coddle black people and that the, if you're not so in support of quote trans rights, then you're a bigot and he will lecture you because he, you know his white privilege and that entitles him to wait what. <laughs> All right, let me pause it there. I'm going to squeeze in a quick break. When we come back, we've got to talk about quite a few things. I want to get to Randy Weingarten, and I want to get to why President Biden did not remember that he was in Ireland like two minutes ago. More with Beck, Buck Sexton right after this. You've heard me talk about Bonner private wine partnerships in the past. I love their rare, rare Malbecs. They're delicious. If you enjoy a glass of wine, try these wines from the extreme altitudes of Argentina. The flavor is unlike any other. Blackberry, leather, smoke, little dark cherry. And these wines are nearly impossible to get on your own. The producers deep in the Andes Mountains make limited quantities. The best part is they've cut out the middleman, so you're not going to deal with a big markup on your order. Today, we have a great offer for you. If you visit bonnerprivatewines.com slash MKS, you will not only get the wine for over 50% off, half off, plus free shipping, you'll also get a bonus bottle of small batch limited production wine from their exclusive wine cellar. That's four bottles for the price of three. It's a deal that's hard to turn down if you're a wine lover like yours truly. Just visit Bonner, spelled B-O-N-N-E-R, privatewines.com slash M-K-S to claim your bonus bottle and become a part of America's most unique wine club. Before we get to Randy, I've got to start with President Biden, who like literally, what, 10 days ago was in Ireland and was asked by a child because he only takes questions from children now. Um, he needed the help from a child, but he was, well, I'll just show it. You watch. It's, the clip speaks for itself. Watch. The last country I've traveled, I'm thinking what's with the last one I was in. I, I've, I've been to 89 met with 89 heads of state so far. So uh, I'm trying to think, what was the last, where was the last place I was? It's hard to keep track. Um, I was, I, I mean, yeah, you're right, Ireland. That's where it was. How'd you know that? Oh my God. How did you not know that? <laughs> well, I, I think we all know that Biden is, 80 and, and an old 80, too. You know, uh, he's somebody who is uh, not at the peak of performance, even for his his demo. You think? Uh, I, yeah. Um, I, I have to say, this is this is actually telling us a lot about the uh, Democrat Party mindset these days and what, what I call the, the apparatus and how it functions. I do not believe that there is really any significant number of Democrats uh, out there who won't vote for Biden again, 
Um, and I also think that they would be willing to vote for Joe Biden again in the same numbers if, if we got to the point where um, they had to like roll him out with a blanket across his knees and he was kind of muttering nonsense. Like they just don't care. Uh, there's a recklessness and a ruthlessness in the way they approach all of this and, and how they just want to maintain power. So I thought maybe it was too much for them in the Democrat primary in 2020 to put this guy forward, but I was wrong. So I, now I will never underestimate their ruthlessness again. And, and that was why with the whole Fetterman thing, I was trying to raise the alarm. I was like, uh, they don't care. They don't care that John Fetterman, for example, had had a severe stroke, was having trouble speaking, which was really based in trouble in cognition because of what was going on in his brain. And as we know, he just went into uh, you know, hospitalized depression therapy for something like six weeks. Um, this is just all about having Democrats. It's like voting for a brand. It's like voting for a machinery. And so they're perfectly comfortable with Joe Biden being a buffoon. And well, he's always been a buffoon, uh, but being somebody who on top of that is really not capable of thinking things through and remembering things and having senior well, and, moments. And this is the same group that tells us over and over, we played the sound by the other day, he's fine. You can't even keep up with him. He's amazing. He's the most fit cognitively and otherwise in the White House, which of course we know are lies. And the, mm. and the same group that then acts shocked and horrified at all the lies from Trump. And Trump 100% tells lies. I'm not saying he doesn't. But you've got people like Sam Harris, who I like on here saying, there's no comparison. There's no comparison to say sort of Trump versus Biden. And it's not just Biden, though. It's Biden and the Democrat Party. And that's what leads me to Randy Weingarten, who, I mean, this week has been the liar in chief. I mean, the biggest, boldest faced lies we've heard publicly, I have to say, in a long, long time. It was very, very uh, just ambitious <laughs> in, in its yeah. deceit level. Oh, so almost, she just to get the audience caught up. Yeah. She uh, she actually testified before Congress this week. She's the head of the American Federations of Teachers uh, Union. And she actually testified, we, the union, wanted to be in school. I've said that over and over again. Teachers wanted to be in school. They knew that in-school learning was important, but they needed it to be safe. We needed both teachers to be safe and kids to be safe. And went on from there. I mean, complete revisionist history. Now, before I get to the sound of the day, I'll tell you this. Uh, we did go back and just pulled a couple of examples. Here she was in July of 2020, looking at whether we'd be opening up anywhere in September. Uh, Betsy DeVos wanted schools to open. She was the education secretary. And Weingarten said, if Trump and DeVos want to create chaos, and want, uh, they will jeopardize re reopening. She says, this is reckless. This is callous. This is cruel the call to reopen the schools. Their, their recklessness scared people so much that now I fear a brain drain of people basically opting out of teaching. They don't want to jeopardize their families. Fast forward later in the pandemic, maybe she saw the light when we had some months behind us. Nope. Um, August of 2020, she said, huge judge strikes down Florida's school reopening order. Celebratory. So glad there not, won't be reopening uh, schools in August. Let's fast forward for six months or so, February 2021. Um, she claimed what that what she needed was just a bit more time to bring her rank and file along with her. Quote, I'm confident that we will overcome the fear, but it's not going to happen in two and a half nanoseconds. This is February 2021. This is a year into the pandemic, and she still was saying we can't open. Now she wants us to believe she was behind reopening the whole time, which leads me to this extraordinary moment on CNN. I don't know if you've seen this today. She went on CNN and a senior political commentator, Scott Jennings, was sitting at the table with her and said what so many millions of Americans would have liked to say. Watch this. Uh, yeah, um, we don't know each other, but speaking on behalf of millions of American parents, I have four at home. I had to teach them at home. My wife had to teach them at home. I am stunned at what you have said this week about you're claiming to have wanted to reopen schools. I think most, you'll find that most parents believe you were the tip of the spear of school closures. There are numerous statements you made over the summer of 20, scaring people to death about the possibility of opening schools. And I hear no remorse whatsoever about the generational damage that's been done to these kids. I have two kids with learning differences. Do you know how hard it is for them to learn at home and not in a classroom that was designed for them? 
And for you to sit in front of Congress and the American people and say, oh, I, I wanted to open them the whole time. I, I am shocked. I'm stunned. I'm stunned. And there are millions of parents who feel the exact same way. I knew and understood the importance of reopening schools and the importance of making sure that people were safe. And poll after poll that we did of parents, and I spent a lot of time with parents, said that they basically understood and supported that we needed to do both. I'm really sorry about your kids. You think parents wanted kids. to keep the kids? Nobody you, you wanted to. Parents Nobody wanted to keep you kids at home. Kids? It's it's oh, insane. It's insane, so Doc. I, I, I call Randy Weingarten uh, the chief education commissar because her job is not has nothing to do with, with your kids and making sure your kids are educated. She is a part of the of the political apparatus of the Democrat Party representing the adults in the teachers unions who are a massive source of Democrat uh, political power, both through donations and through the mobilization they do uh, for for voting. So Randy Weingarten is on this issue. And, and I, you know, I, I don't like to get angry at people or individuals. I like to uh, debate ideas. She's an insidious liar. Uh, she's a disgrace. The Biden uh, White House and all the people around him who push for school closures, they did this because they could get away with it. And they did it for the adults who were either too paranoid and or too lazy to do their jobs when it was clear that, first of all, everybody was going to get COVID and they should have figured that out pretty early on. That's a whole other conversation because uh, everyone did get COVID. But beyond that, um, including all the kids. None of the kids were prevented from getting COVID. This was completely insane. COVID wasn't a risk to children. Uh, but why was it that, you know, the, uh, you know, EMS and, and fire and my grocery store clerk, the guy who worked at CVS, they were all going into their jobs. They were going into their jobs in, in April and May of 2020. But for teachers, it was too dangerous. You know, they really, by the way, to do this, part of it was the completely false proposition that they forwarded that like children were the were going to be spread. It turns out children actually really don't spread this to adults very readily at all. Um, and there's so much misinformation all along. Oh, but here. Randy, Randy had special scientific knowledge, Buck. You may not have understood that. She went on um, in her testimony to say this. Listen to this. It's SOT7. We knew that remote education was not a substitute for opening schools, but we also knew that people had to be safe. And maybe it's because I live in New York City. I live near a hospital. Every other minute there was a <sighs> ambulance. There was terror. Oh my God. Our members were terrified. Others were terrified. And what we were simply looking for was clear scientific guidance. And when we couldn't get it, we did it ourselves. They did it themselves, Buck. It was all the scary ambulances. Hello, I lived in New York yeah. for 17 years. You see here ambulances all the time, in part yeah. because they don't fight crime anymore. People are getting shot. It's not because they were running to get all the kids who got COVID in schools. They wanted teachers to have a taxpayer-funded, long-term, longer than just the summer vacation, uh, yes. paid leave at home. That's all this, that's all this was. This was yes. just a straight-up power play. Randy Weingarten was 100% involved with the Biden administration in crafting, and little Fauci, too. They all play this game. They push for something, and, and they go to the levers of power, and they push toward lockdowns. They push toward these crazy rules. And then they say, oh, I didn't do it. It was some other person who did it. No, especially with the teachers thing, by the way. We knew in the summer of 2020 that schools should be open. The there, you know, Sweden kept schools open and had already opened schools. We had already looked at the data. You could see countries where that it was clearly no risk to children. And the adults, it's not like you have a lot of 75-year-olds who are teaching third grade, Megan. Like this was crazy. They never had any basis for this whatsoever, other than it was advent advantageous to Joe Biden in 2020 because of the climate of fear. They figured, keep everybody terrified. They'll vote for old man Jai, uh, Biden in the basement, which is what they did. And then beyond that, they realized, oh, we can just like play a Zoom lesson and stay at home and get our full pay and benefits and do nothing all the time. 
The teachers who say, the only people who are as bad in my mind in terms of the rank and file as the teachers who were so excited to stay home were the airline attendants who were so excited and threatened to kick everybody off the airline forever for letting the mask slip beneath their nose. No, but, but no one was to, worse than the Chicago than the Chicago Teachers Union. They, they don't the, care the, about your kids. I remember just them? They just, they I, don't, yeah, oh, of course. I, we don't do teachers union stories without running this video. These are the people who, who are so desperate to reopen the schools. Remember their interpretive dance showing us how these totally fit and able-bodied teachers couldn't possibly go back into the classroom. Cue it up. Make it make sense. Safety is essential. Oh my God. Keep our students and our teachers safe. These women are in safe. their 30s. These yeah. are the people who were desperate, desperate to reopen. And by the way, on Randy's lies, Buck, um, we all know that the reason that the CDC modified its guidance on when you could open or close schools was because of Randy. She admitted that she was BFFs with Rochelle Walensky, that other hysteric, who is running the CDC, here's SOT 9. Do not talk to representatives you have a, of the government. Do you have a direct number to, to Director Walensky? Do I have Director Walensky's direct number? Yes. Yes, I have Director Walensky's direct number. Well, hopefully she'll give it to me too. Thank you. And I yield back. Yeah, we get it. They what they did to children um, with the lockdowns, the shutdowns of the schools, obviously, as part of that, the masking of children, um, it was child abuse. It was monstrous. This became highly, highly, highly partisan. We know this because there were Republicans and I'm here in Florida. I moved to Florida. God bless Ron DeSantis. He looked at the data. The data was very clear that schools should be open, and the data was clear really by May of 2020. You could argue even sooner than that. But there was absolutely no basis. They kept the schools shut for, you know, the 2020 to 2021 school year. And then some of them kept it. Uh, we're, we're trying to close it even beyond that. So what you see here and, and you know, this is also it's enraging because I, I know parents that have uh, special needs kids um, who are the ones who are the most harmed by this uh, parents of children, you know, who are low income households, the people that the teachers, oh, uh, by the way, I've sat on, like I, I've seen Randy Weingarten before. And, you know, years ago, I, I interviewed about something. It's always about the children. She doesn't give squat about the children. Okay. No. She's a Democrat hack. The teachers unions, honestly, should all be disbanded. That's a whole other yes. conversation because they don't care about your kids. They are thuggish. They are Democrat shock troops for trying to raise money and trying to make sure that you don't have any accountability in the public school system in these Democrat strongholds and cities all across the country. But what they did was child abuse. You know, I had a speech impediment, Megan, when I was a, when I was a kid. I had to get speech therapy for years. The kids who needed the help the most, and by the way, the masking thing, as we all know, was horrible for kids who need to be and able to- And even Fauci's to admitted now, it, maybe it helps at the margins, maybe 10%, that's it. And that, that's not, that's not even, and by the way, that's not even true. They've just, they just keep walking it back slowly because of the mask lunatics. But honestly, every single parent in the country who didn't hold Democrats accountable just over the school lockdown issue, they should look in the mirror. I, I don't know what to say to them. I mean, this, I, I am legitimately furious that- Fauci, who is probably the worst person in the country in terms of policy that results in misery, destruction, and despair, um, that they just let this stuff go. It was a little yeah. Fauci, Walensky, Randy Weingarten apparatus of evil and child abuse and, and economic and psychological devastation with no health benefit whatsoever. None. And Biden's running around saying, if you won't get the shot, you're like a menace to society and should be treated as you know typhoid Mary. And it is fired. appalling what they did. Appalling and, and, what they did. The, what she said there was so indicative and again triggering of what we all went through with them. With remember Rochelle Walensky like crying, like I just have this impending sense of doom. And then you hear Randy Weingarten, like you say, with a scrunched up face. Like I lived in New York too. I guarantee you, she's probably my old neighbor on the Upper West Side. You know, it was just the terror. It was the terror. Yeah. Fuck you and your terror. You terrorized our children. I don't care about your mental health issues unless they affect me. And they did. They affected an entire nation full of school children and they're still not sorry. And she's still in control, as is Walensky. Okay, Fauci 
He's fired, but he's not disgraced. He's not fired. He, he retired. He resigned, but he's not disgraced. Yeah. They're still, they're still running these, these operations. And the American people had yeah. the chance to elect new leaders. And they have another chance in 2024 to elect somebody who could possibly get rid of these people or at least not be influenced by them. And Buck, the polls are very uncertain. It doesn't look like they're necessarily inclined to do it. Yeah, I'm. I'm never going to let this go. By the way, I just. I, I've made this statement to my audience, to my friends and family. The people that did this, I will never forgive them. I will never forget it, and I will continue to push because they're going to try to rewrite Soviet style the history of the pandemic in every way that they can. They are child abusing, hysteric, lunatic, totalitarians, and it was. It became very clear this was the Democrat playbook. The Democrat Party should be held responsible for this, and um, I am so furious about it. But I do enjoy very yeah. much talking to you, Megan. So thank you for letting me hang out. <laughs> and um, we'll get to the story another day. I didn't even give you the questions in advance, like the LA Times appears to have done with Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that was so all true. off the cuff for you. Indeed. Radio well stuff. Done. Thanks, Buck Megan. Sexton, Great to see you. always a pleasure. We're going to be right back with the high school volleyball player who was severely injured by that trans player. Now, she's decided to speak out about her injuries and about the fact that they made her play against a biological male. And guess what that biological male is doing? That so-called trans player, trolling her. We'll bring you that guest and the update next. Let's talk about anxiety. Chances are you, like most of us, have experienced anxiety at one point in your life. If you have, you know it's no fun. Well, did you know that our dogs can experience anxiety too? That's right, anxiety in dogs is actually much more common than you may think. Luckily though, there is help. The Escape Proof High Anxiety Dog Crate by Impact Dog Crate is the first of a kind dog crate designed specifically for dogs suffering from anxiety. Constructed from heavy duty aluminum, this crate is built to provide the maximum amount of protection for your anxious pup. I know what you may be thinking, wouldn't a crate make my dog's anxiety worse? The answer is no. Dogs enjoy having a safe and secure space like a den where they can go and relax and de-stress and not be bothered by anybody, whether it's a kid or you or another dog. I can speak to this personally. I see my dogs go in their crates all the time. We leave the doors open. They're like, where's Thunder? Where's Strud? They're asleep in their crate with the door open. They could be anywhere, but they choose to go in there. The high anxiety dog crate provides just that. And it's even backed up with a 10-year dog damage warranty. Thanks to impact dog crates, dog owners have peace of mind knowing their beloved pups and home are safe. It's a win-win. Go to impactdogcrates.com and enter the code MK to get 15% off your crate. Our next guest is high school volleyball player Peyton McNabb. She suffered severe head and neck injuries this past fall when a transgender athlete spiked a volleyball that hit her in the face. This month, Peyton decided to speak out about her experience to encourage lawmakers to take action to keep biological males out of girls' sports. Peyton, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. All right, so uh, how old are you? I'm 18. 18, all right, and, when, and were you 17 or 18 when this injury occurred? I was 17. All right, and where did you grow up? Where were you going to school? Um, so I currently go to Hawassi Dam High School in Murphy, North Carolina. Um, but I'll be graduating this spring. And were you a volleyball player for most of your life, or did you come to it, you know, just in high school? I played all throughout middle school and high school. And were you good? I mean, how was your? How were you? And how was your team? Uh, we were pretty. We were pretty average. I mean, <laughs> we we had good players though. I was on varsity for three years out of my four. Okay. Now explain volleyball to me. Is it like, like I have a daughter who plays soccer and generally you get a position in soccer and you play that position. Is it the same in volleyball or can you go to any one of the spots if you make the team? Um, they'll try to put you in a certain spot. For example, I was a setter. So, cause I am a lot shorter than everybody else. So I would just set the ball up for our power hitters. And that's, that was my, my job was. Okay. And so you'd been playing against other schools, I assume, for, for all the times you were on the varsity squad. Yes. All right, so now you there comes this time when you're going to play against this other team that has a trans player. What was the name of that school? Um, Highlands High School. 
And did you know that there was a trans player at Highland High School? We were aware. Um, we've known since we're the same age, so we've known since their freshman year. Um, but we it's a conference team, so we had to play them. We couldn't just refuse the game. So we went into the game knowing that it was a transgender athlete. And was there any concern at that point? Yeah, there was. We knew that we couldn't really play back. Um, they hit it so hard that we didn't really know. We weren't used to taking hits that hard, so it was difficult for us from the beginning. So you knew that this person was going to have extra firepower because it's it's obviously it's a biological boy. This is not a, a biological girl. He's going to have who went through male puberty, as I understand it, with you know longer limbs and and stronger muscles. Yes. Do you know any background on the trans player, like when they transitioned, et cetera? Um, I don't. I don't know any of their like, you know, life or anything. But I just know because uh, they had to tell all the schools when they started playing. So our school knew. And is this person, it described this person's physical appearance. They're a lot taller. Um, they're a lot, I mean, obviously stronger. So <laughs> looks, looks just like a, it doesn't look, it's not like Leah Thomas. They do look more like a girl. Mm-hmm. So more like a girl, but identifiable <laughs> as a biological male. Yes. Okay. So did you, were you at all afraid going into this match or did you feel like I'm, I'll, it'll be fine? I was afraid. I was, um, I know a lot of the girls were, I was just kind of used to it because it was my fourth year, but I knew all the younger players, they were really scared, but they just knew that they had to play. So. So you've played against this team and this particular player in the past? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And, no, and nobody got hurt? But of course, this person like you is aging, is getting older and stronger and growing into what is a biologically male body um, mm -hmm. as you go into your biologically female adult body uh, as you get older. So what happened in the game when you got hurt? Walk us through the moment. So um, I was hit and everything went black. Um, my teammates and coaches said I was unconscious for about 30 seconds. While my team was huddling around me, the opposing team was laughing. Um, but when I came back to consciousness, a trainer took me to the sidelines and checked me for a concussion and told me I was fine and could go back in. But luckily, my coach didn't let me go back in. Mm. Well, how are you? Do you remember how you were feeling? I was really, um, my adrenaline was really hot and I was really, I don't know. I just didn't know what to think. I was really angry, but I was just hoping that it wouldn't happen to anyone else after I was out. Did they pull the trans athlete, the other school, no. the other team? No, they didn't. So this person continued playing against your teammates even after you were hurt? Yes. What was the reaction in the stands with the parents? You know, I go to these games all the time with my kids. I feel like there would have been a revolt by the parents. Everyone went silent and no one really knew what to do. There is a scream in the video. Um, my parents weren't there, actually. That was the only game they didn't go to. But my grandma was there and she, um, she was just so upset. She came down to the court and made sure I was okay. Everyone just kind of didn't know what to say. It was really awkward. We do have video of the moment, which I'll play for the watching audience. Forgive me, you don't need to look at it if it's upsetting to you, but I just want to show them what happened. You're on the, that's the trans player that we have the green circle around, spiking the ball right into your face and down mm -hmm. you go. The trans player is obviously larger, very power, powerful spike. And I mean, it doesn't look like you even had a chance to, to respond to that. I mean, looking back, do you feel like you did? did? Was there any chance of you to defend that ball? No. Um, a lot of people say that there was, and I should have protected myself better, but I had, I seriously had no time to even think of that. 
Do you, when you watch that back now, is it upsetting to you? How does it make you feel? Um, yeah, it's upsetting, but I think I've seen it so much. I've kind of just got used to it. Mm, mm, right. I think our society's kind of gotten used to it, which we, we cannot. And that's one mm-hmm. of the reasons it's so important you're speaking out. So I'm going to get to your testimony this week and what you're doing to make some good, some positive impact from all this. But talk about your recovery because, you know, you get hurt in sport. You think, okay, that was unfortunate. And then you kind of move on. You you were not able to really just move on. No, I I was out for the rest of my volleyball season. Um, I came back like halfway through my basketball or a little bit in my basketball, but it wasn't the same as it has been the last three years. And I was really, I just wasn't playing like I used to. Um, But healing has been really slow. I've been trying to heal and take my time with it so I can get 100% back. But it's hard because, you know, I want to still do things and um, have fun and stuff. So, What are the lingering effects? This happened in September, this past September. Now here we are chatting at the end of April. What are the lasting effects from what happened to you? I have impaired vision, so I have to, I had to get my glasses uh, redone. I have partial paralysis on my right side, so my right side lags slightly. Um, I, I have really bad headaches, and but not as bad, but they just, they're getting, they're getting better, but uh, I do have bad headaches. I have to have accommodations at school and test in separate rooms and get extra help when that's never been a problem before and just different things like that. So how has this affected you emotionally? It has given me, um, I was really depressed. I had a really long depressive episode and I have anxiety now. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to get better from it, but it has affected me, you know, mentally and emotionally. What were you feeling depressed about? It was, it was just really sad because this is my last year and it was nothing like I imagined it was going to be. Everything changed. I can't do things that, you know, I've had no problem doing in the past. And it just was really hard for me to accept. This became a national news story pretty soon after it happened. Did the person who hurt you ever reach out to you and say, my God, I'm so sorry? They did reach out about a week ago um, for the first time ever. And there was no remorse. It wasn't an apology or anything. It was kind of just a little hateful comment. But that's, that's the only time they've directly reached out to me. I understand there was a message to the effect of, I, I appear to be renting space in your head. Yes. I'm living rent-free in your head. Yes, that's, that's what it was. <laughs> so no remorse whatsoever? No. And this person never reached out to you between September and now at all to say, I'm sorry, or are you okay? Nope, not at all. That is unbelievable. That's like... When you talk about this with your parents, I feel like the parents would be like, what the hell? Where Not only should the trans person be reaching out, but the parents should be reaching out. The school, the, all of them should be reaching out to make sure you're okay, to offer help with your medical bills, and to make sure this doesn't happen again. None of that happened? No. Wow. That is just a disappointment on a human level. And the one reach out is a snarky comment after you went on Fox News with Laura. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, this is not the way for, for trans people to get others to be more open-minded to their participation in sport. Uh, but you know what? We shouldn't be open-minded because it shouldn't happen. And this is a perfect example of why. So you ultimately decide, oh, can I ask you first before we get to your new activism, which is great, was there any backlash against you? Sometimes in these stories, people turn against the victim. Um, surprisingly, there has been an overwhelming support. Um, everyone that 
I live around, they've all been so supportive and there's been so many people reach out and be really, really, really nice and um, kind. There has been some um, hate, I guess, but everything they say, they don't actually know what happened. So they're just kind of going for me and calling me transphobic and like hateful and things like that. But that's not what I'm doing at all. Um, you know, like if you want to be any of those things, like that is your business and no one's saying you can't do that. It's just trying to protect women and women's sports. Did that come after you spoke out publicly about it or while you were just still suffering silently and privately? After I spoke out. Yeah. God forbid you actually use your voice to say, I have a few objections to this setup. So you have managed to find your voice. Was that difficult? Were, were you scared to like, because now there's this bill in North Carolina to try to keep biological boys out of girls' sports, which seems like the perfect opportunity for you to say, I would like to comment. Um, was it scary? Because it's always easier just to be quiet. Yeah, it, it was really scary. Uh, I'm not used to doing this stuff at all, but... You know, I, I thought it would be so wasteful not to use my story to try to do something good from it. So, you know, I don't want my sister to have to deal with this anymore. I don't want my, my the rest of my family, my teammates, my future daughters. I don't want them to ever have to even think about this stuff. Mm-hmm. Good for you. You're fighting for my daughter, too, right now. So you go before the North Carolina, was it the, the House, the Senate, the just both? What was it? Who was it? Um, it was the House. And then I went before other people too, but I don't really know who it was. I was okay. just talking. <laughs> okay. And we have a clip of you in front of the, the state legislature. I guess it was the House, a committee hearing, offering mm. a bit of your testimonial. Here it is. Due to the North Carolina High School Athletic Association policy allowing biological males to compete against biological females, my life has forever been changed. On September 1st, 2022, I was severely injured in a high school volleyball game by a transgender athlete on the opposing team. I suffered from a concussion and neck injury that to this day I'm still recovering from. I could go on and on about how this incident has affected my life but I'm not here for that. I'm here for every biological female athlete behind me. Allowing biological males to compete against biological females is dangerous. I may be the first to come before you with an injury, but if this doesn't pass, I won't be the last. Mm. Do you, first of all, what do we know the outcome of the bill? Um, they said that it had passed through the Senate, and that's the last I've heard. So that was good news, but that's the last I've heard. We, at the federal level, unfortunately, have a president who's fighting against you, um, who's trying to erase the 19 state bans against biological boys participating in girls' sports. The president doesn't think we should have bans, even if it's decided on a state-by-state level. Mm -hmm. what, what's your message to him? Um, my message to him is he doesn't know what it's like. And for him to make those decisions for women, it's kind of um, mind numbing because it has is he's never had to experience that. So he doesn't know. Do you think he's endangering young girls? I do. Yes. I think he is putting my sister, you know, in danger. I think he's putting every other biological female in danger by doing that. Did the other school continue letting the trans player participate in this sport against other schools? Yes, they did. They did? Mm -hmm. so they never pulled this trans player. So, like, what about other schools? Did they say, hey, in, in light of what happened with Peyton, we're not playing you? Yes, there were a few schools that did that. Um, almost every school was super supportive around here, and— of who? Um, of me. Okay. All right. Good. Good. Because I, I would imagine, you know, if you're running a school district, you have to worry about liability. You know, you have to you have to worry about 
you know, getting sued. Once you've seen that this person is hurting other girls, girls on other teams, you've got to do something about it or you're on the hook. Have you considered that? Have you considered any legal action? I don't really know. I, I'm i just trying to help it stop. So I, we haven't really thought about any of that stuff. Two other girls who may be in the position of having to play against this trans person, should they do it? No. <laughs> no, they should not put themselves in danger like that. Um, if they can. I don't, some, we're getting forced to, really, but if they have the decision, I wouldn't do it. Do you think there's a risk girls are going along with it just so they're not called names like transphobe? Yes, I definitely do. I think the the people that throw those terms out and um, try to bring you down like that, they're, they're so um, focused on including those kind of people and everything, and they're potentially excluding women. Last question. For There are a lot of women and men sitting at home right now agreeing with everything you've said, but they're worried if they speak out, they're going to get called names, their boss is going to think less of them, they're going to suffer some backlash. So they let people like you and Riley Gaines stay on the front lines of this kind of a battle and just kind of wish you luck. What do you want those people to know? That there is a lot more support than you think. Um, that it's the right thing. Obviously, if the world is against you, then it's the right thing. And, you know, it's, you can do it. It's, um, it needs to stop. So all, all these people need to come together and stand up for it because it doesn't need to go on any longer. You going to school next year? You're, is, are you going to play more sports? I am. I will be going to um, college this fall. And no, I won't be playing any sports, unfortunately. Wow. I, th- I can think of another activity that may be taking up your time. I hope I see you <laughs> next to Riley with the Independent Women's Forum, speaking out, using your voice uh, to help others. Peyton, all the best to you. Congrats on learning such an important lesson at such a young age on how important it is to speak out. Yeah, good luck to you. Thank you. Wow. When we come back, another brave young woman speaking out. My next guest is only 14 uh, from across the pond. And now another very brave young woman speaking out. Our next guest has chosen to stay anonymous, which sadly she really does have to do in order to protect herself, to talk about this issue. She goes by the pseudonym Brand Dove. That's her brand, Dove, kind of like Brandon, but not exactly. Um, She is a 14-year-old high school student in Ireland who has been absolutely unafraid to speak out against gender ideology being taught in her classrooms and just shoved down the throats of young women who don't want it. She attended the Let Women Speak rally in Belfast this month with Kelly J. Keene, who you'll remember as Posey Parker. She came on our show, I think, two Fridays ago. And she, Brandov shared this amazing poem. All right, the poem's called I Am Not a Dress. And my producer, Kelly McGuire, forwarded it to me. I tweeted it out that day. I have played it privately numerous times since then. I just go on and I click the video of Brandov reading this poem at the Kelly J. Keene event. And you're going to find out why I love it so much. Listen, I can't believe that she came up with this. She's so young. And the messaging is so spot on. If you are looking for the motivation to use your voice in in the way Peyton was just asking you to, listen to this two minutes and this powerful poem. We are women. We are warriors of steel. Woman is something no man will ever feel. Woman is not a skill that any man can hone. Woman is our words, and it is ours alone. I am not a dress to be worn on a whim. A man in a dress is nonetheless a him. Women are not simply what we wear. If this offends you, I do not care. I 
am not an idea in any man's mind and my purpose in life is not to be kind. So when my rights are trampled every day of the week, I will not stand by being docile and meek. I am not defined by sexist guys. There is more to a woman than that shallow guys. That guys of dresses, bikinis and skirts. Those clothes are not what womanhood is worth. I am not a bitch, a turf, a whore, a slag, hysterical, a witch, a slut, a hag. No, I am a woman, I'm a female, who will not let her rights be put up for sale. I am not, I am not defined by what men are not. So to hell with cis misogynistic rot. I am a woman, I'm not a subset of my sex. If this makes me a dinosaur, so be it, I'm a T-Rex. I am not a bleeder, nor a menstruator, a womb carrier, or a uterus hugger. Those words and phrases are such a sham. Just call me woman, it is who I am. We are women, we are warriors of steel. Woman is something no man will ever feel. Woman is not a skill that any man can hone. Woman is our words and it is ours alone. It's unbelievable. It's like brings tears every time, right? Brandov, thank you so much for coming on and thank you for your beautiful words. Thank you for having me on here. Oh my gosh, you're so you're so young. I can hear it in your voice and I understand why you don't want to go on cam with your face because you've already had enough backlash. Can I just ask how did you how did you come up with that? How did you think of those beautiful words? Um I first came up with the idea when I attended an event in Ireland in November. It was called um, Women's Space to Speak. And one woman shared a poem she had written. And I was like, hey, I think I could do something really good. And yeah, I started writing it then. I came up with the first uh, couple of lines that night. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I know your mother has been your advocate and helper along. When you read that to your mother, did she weep? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, she did a little. <laughs> I mean, if it's got, if it got me, I can imagine it got her. It's so beautiful. It is a, it's a battle cry. That's what it is. It's a battle cry for women to remember who they are, what they're capable of and what they should and should not stand for. And you needed this in your own life for just sick reasons. When I read about what's happening to you, Brenda, I thought, oh my God, we have it easy over here. Like Ireland has lost its love and mind. They, the, the indoctrination that you are being subjected to is absolutely breathtaking. So walk us through when it started to seep into your life, like in school and how. Okay, so I started secondary school and that's high school in America. So, um, yep. so yeah, I started high school. Yeah, so my first year there, and I was there for maybe eight weeks when my school celebrated this thing called Stand Up Week. And we were told that Stand Up Week was this week where we basically try to show members of the LGBTQ plus community in our school that they're welcome there. But that was just such a lie it was about shoving tq plus propaganda down our throats and in one class my teacher gave us this booklet published by an organization called belong to and it was just full of misinformation and it said stuff about the i have it a copy of it here actually yeah gender identity and gender expression and how your sex is assigned at birth, which is just ridiculous. I mean, it's not assigned, it's observed. And many women have it observed in utero before the baby is even born. And Mm -hmm. yes, so so I asked some questions about this and it all went from there. 
So you you challenged? You said, what do you mean? You, you made comments like that. I mean, it's not assigned, it's observed. And how did that go over with your teachers? Um, not well. The next week, um, I got pulled out of class by my science teacher. She was actually my science teacher. And she told me that the previous week, I had made some offensive comments about trans people. And so she basically told me that I was being transphobic. And With she what comments me, in particular? What, what in particular did she object to? She didn't say. She just said I'd made offensive comments. And were, what were she, the comments that you had made? Was it like, what do you remember um, having said? I said something about men shouldn't be in women's prisons, even if they identify as women, like they're still men. Yeah, I asked about questions about what was in the plus, in the LGBTQ plus. Because I think we'd all like vague. to know that. Yes. <laughs> it's very vague. I'm not even sure what the Q is. I've been told it means questioning. I've been told it means queer to this moment. I, I think there might be a disagreement on it, but okay. So you were questioning mm -hmm. this questioning itself. And you yeah. were told by the science teacher, no, don't do that. Yes. I So I argued back with my science teacher. So she expected me to be terribly repentant that I'd been transphobic, but um, I wasn't. <laughs> and um, at one point she told me that being a man or a woman has nothing to do with your reproductive system. And mm. th this, this is my science teacher. And she told me that with a straight face. Like how It's just insane. Now, how had you prepared yourself for that kind of exchange? Like, a lot of 14-year-olds are not even thinking about gender and this whole gender ideology craziness. You know, how were you up to speed on the insanity that was being sp spooned to you? Um, my mom had to been telling me about this for a while now, but by that point. And so before I started high school, um. She told me that they might celebrate this thing called stand-up week, but we had no idea it would be as bad as it was. But just in case, mom told me about all this trans stuff, so I was prepared for if it did happen. And Good then for it her. Did. And, and she backed you up. Like, you don't have to buy into this or pretend that you buy into this. Yeah, she did. That's great. I, I mean, that's I think for mothers out there, that's half the battle. Like, I say to my kids, too, you— you do not actually need to participate. You do not need to say your pronouns. You don't need to buy into these discussions at all. So it, I do think it's, there's an important lesson there with your mom. Now, it wasn't without consequence because it, as I understand it, not only did your teachers not appreciate your boldness on this issue, but your classmates turned on you in large, large measure too. Yes, they did. And um, What happened? After the class where I asked about men in women's prisons, we, um, a couple of my classmates came up to me and they started telling me about how I had been very transphobic. And I had counted these people as friends, but then suddenly after that, they stopped talking to me and they had reported me to my, they had, they reported me for what I'd said in that class. Hmm. So your, your friends turn on you. And then yeah. ultimately you have a conversation with the head of school about inclusivity. Can you tell us about that? Yes. So after I refused to give in to my science teacher's insanity, um, I got pulled out of class again a few weeks later by my year head. And he told me again that I'd made some very offensive comments. and. I said that no, I'd stated reality, and yeah, that's not offensive. And if you find that offensive, that's not my problem. I'm going to state reality anyway. And he said, well, because this school is really inclusive, it's not the right atmosphere for you to voice your beliefs. <laughs> so in other words, he told me that because the school is so inclusive, my beliefs aren't included. Wow. I mean, did 
Do you think he was in any way cognizant of how absurd what he was saying was? Did he, he just didn't care because he's woke and he's assigned on to this other ideology? Yeah, well, when you, when you can't, I mean, the whole trans ideology is just a walking pile of contradictions. So I suppose one more wasn't going to Indeed. be too much to him. What was what happened on the bullying front? You know, I understand they defaced your desk. There were a couple of disturbing incidents with some unkind people. Yes. So I went into class one day, and this happened a few times actually. But um, yeah, I went in one day, and someone had scrawled "trans rights are human rights" across my desk. Another time, I went into class, and someone had scrawled the same slogan across a whiteboard and yeah in classes where there's no seating plan and I sit on my own I'll I'll, if I arrive first I sit on it at a table and everyone else actively avoids that table because Mm -hmm. you just can't associate with a transphobe and yeah I always eat on my own everyone avoids me and this is so wrong. I like I can't believe that all the students feel as you know the woke trans advocates feel. I isn't there's not is it a co-ed school? Are there boys who are seeing it the way you're seeing? Is there anybody there? Or do you think you have supporters they're just too afraid? The boys see it for what it is. They see it for the madness, but they still don't associate with me. They just think it's a joke and they're like, oh, she's because like being a transphobe is really uncool. So they're not going to hang out with me. So how, I mean, you're young. I re- it wasn't so long ago. I remember being a 14 year old girl and getting targeted by the rest of the grade doesn't feel good. So how are you, how are you handling yourself every day? How does it feel? Um, so at lunch, um, well, I might write a Twitter thread (laughs) just to, you know, show of defiance. I'm going to, you're not going to stop me talking about this issue. I'm not going to be silenced about my rights. I'm going to keep going. Um, You're the the next Posey Parker, but keep going. Um, sometimes I think of the suffragettes and what they went through because women fighting this, we are the suffragettes over again. We're fighting for our rights. This, And I think what would have happened if they hadn't spoken out, like we would, we still would not have the vote if the suffragettes had not spoken out. So we have to speak out. I think of my sister as well. I don't want her to have to deal with this rubbish at school. And then she, how old is she? Um, she is five. Oh, wow. She's little. You, um, I mean, you have what, three more years to get through until um, you're out of there? Or what year are you in? I'm in second year now, so I've got four more years. Oh, four more years. I mean, all you need is one. I can speak to this as having been very badly bullied in my seventh grade year. I, I, everyone turned on me. And you just need one. I feel like you're going to find, even if you find them in an outside activity, you need just the one. And you know where you have so many fans and supporters around the world now, Brando. I mean, like me and my audience. So just remember that. Always remember that those haters inside your school are not your world. They're just well, people you have you. to get through to get to the rest of us on the other side. Um, let me ask you this, because I want to ask you about some of the lines in your in your poem. Women are not simply what we wear. If this offends you, I do not care. Um, This, to me, brought up things like Dylan Mulvaney, um, the pictures. There is more to women than shallow guys. Where you say, I am not defined by sexist lies. There is more to women than shallow guys. When I read that, I was thinking about people like Dylan Mulvaney, who I don't know about you, but I find particularly offensive because Dylan's version of womanhood reduces women to the these ridiculous stereotypes. But Dylan's defenders would say, well, that's Dylan's experience of what it's like to be female. And Dylan's full of love and is a joyful person. And why are you all being so 
mean to Dylan? And why are you all feeling so offended by Dylan, who's expressing womanhood in the way that feels real to him? What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, he's not expressing womanhood because he can't, because he's a man. And yeah, so I just don't get why he can't be a man who wears dresses, who wants to wear makeup. And yes, if he tries to say he's a woman when he's not, we have every right to object to that. Why is it important? Why do you think it's important to object? Um, if he's a woman, if if any if any man can declare himself a woman, where does it stop? So he's he's a man, and he says he's a woman, and if we we have to accept that, well, we're told we have to anyway. Then it brings you on to men like Barbie Kardashian. If we have who's a man in women's prisons who identifies as a woman, so it starts with Dylan Mulvaney. We say he's a woman. Maybe he's not harming anyone. But then what about this man? But but this man, Kardashian, why isn't he a woman if Dylan's a woman? It's just a yeah, slippery once, slope. That's the thing. Once you, once you engage in the fiction, you're in the fiction. That's the problem. Yes, that's it. So are you anti-pronouns, you know, preferred pronouns? Yes. I wouldn't use them because I that would be a lie. And mm-hmm. I was given a form once in school and I was asked to fill it out. And so everyone in the class was. And it was a form about pronouns. And I was asked, would I use someone's preferred pronouns? And they gave you four options. The options were definitely, probably, probably not. And I don't know. They didn't give you an option to say no. I definitely would not, but I just went with the probably not. But yeah, no, I wouldn't. Well, you know that there are a lot of people who say it's discourteous. You know, it's not about truth versus real, uh, you know, non-truth. It's about being kind, being considerate of somebody. And that leads me to your line. I am not an idea in any man's mind. And my purpose in life is not to be kind. So what, what about that? You know, the, well, what is it, what does it hurt, you know, to, to just be kind and not offend somebody by saying their preferred pronoun? Because it's a lie. And we've, like, since when do we affirm someone's delusion? People have always had misconceptions about who they are. Take, for example, people with anorexia. We don't tell them that they're fat because... It's not true. So we shouldn't tell men who think they're women that they are women. And what if you met a trans person who said, oh, I'm I'm a woman. You know, it's a a guy who says, I'm a woman. And he's sitting right there with you at, you know, a table. Would you, would you use the pronoun there? Like, how would you handle that awkwardness? Um, well, if I was talking to him, I probably wouldn't be using she, her, or he, him. Yeah. Anyway. But, um, yeah. But if I had to use a pronoun in his presence, I would still use he, him. Because I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to bend at all on this. I admire your courage. And I'm working on finding my own in the wake of conversations like this. You know, I would talk with Kelly J. I've sp- spoken with so many people over the past months and years on this, and I'm really starting to come around. I'm seeing the light because of courageous young women like you. So while your message gets rejected and labeled negatively by your teachers and your classmates, just know you're influencing people like me with very powerful platforms who have millions of people listening to me. And I know my audience is listening to you feeling the way I am feeling. So don't stop. Don't back down. Don't let them cow you. Don't let them hurt you so much that you submit or or silence your voice. You're helping us all. Thank you. Yeah, don't intend on doing any of that. I'm not <laughs> backing down. I have every expectation we're going to be seeing a lot more of you, especially once you hit the age of majority. And I can't wait to see at that point your beautiful face and learn much, much more about you. Brenda, all the best. Thank you for coming on. 
Okay, thank you. Wow, what an extraordinary young woman. What an extraordinary person. All of her courage and bravery, which is available to us all. Before we go, I want to give you um, some entries in the from the MK Mailbag. That's where all of you write into us, and I read the emails. We pick a few, and we read them on the air. If you want to email me, it's Megan, M-E-G-Y-N, at MeganKelly.com. If you go to MeganKelly.com, they'll make it easy for you, and you can subscribe to our American News Minute with a crazy story about Strudwick this week. He's just a naughty, naughty boy. There's just no getting around it. Every week, another gift. Um, Okay, so this lot got a lot of mail about Tucker this week. Uh, Kathy in Pennsylvania writes, I came to Fox to watch Tucker after Afghanistan was not being covered by Legacy News, and I couldn't understand why. I stuck with Fox, got Fox Nation, and loved Tucker's specials. I'm out. Bye, Fox. Uh, Mark in New York writes, your show and Tucker's show were the only reasons I watched Fox News. Hannity and Waters won't keep me tuned in. Done with Fox. Marjorie writes, I was only keeping Xfinity TV account to watch Tucker. F them all. I just canceled. Jackie writes, I have talked with so many people today about Tucker, and they all feel the same as me. We are so mad at Fox for doing this. I always defend them. Not anymore. I hope Fox suffers because of this. Tucker was Fox News. I mean, the overwhelming majority of you guys felt that way. Some disagreed. Nick, appreciate the voice of dissent because it's always great to have opposing points of view. He writes in, Fox did the right thing by getting rid of Tucker. The text messages showed he was putting forth propaganda he knew was false on the stolen election claims of 2020. He lied to his audience on purpose for ratings. He may be an opinion show, but that is still no excuse. This also puts more pressure on MSNBC to ditch Maddow and Joy Reid for the same reasons. Now, I would just say this to you, Nick. I don't think that that's accurate, that that his text messages showed he was putting forth propaganda he knew was false on the stolen election claims of 2020. Tucker never bought into the Dominion claims. Never. There was never a show he did, or that even Dominion claimed he did, that showed that. He talked about the 2020 election being unfair. And I think the term rigged has come to mean different things to different people. You know, he talked about the change of rules in Pennsylvania when it came to the mailing balloting and so on and so forth. We could go down the list, but there's nothing in his text messages that shows he did not believe that. Um, there's been a conflation, I think, in the way a lot of the mainstream has covered his text messages on that front. But in any event, appreciate the feedback either way. Kamala Harris got some mail on, on her. Amy writes, Oh my word. Okay, wait. She's. I'm going to show you what she's reacting to because it's worth playing. Um, she got a kick out of this soundbite we ran this week. Watch. So I think it's very important, as you have heard from so many incredible leaders, for us at every moment in time, and certainly this one, to see the moment in time in which we exist and are present and to be able to contextualize it to understand where we exist in the history and in the moment as it relates not only to the past, but the future. (laughs) Wake me when it's over. It's just such inanity. Absolutely nothing is being said. Uh, Amy writes in, oh my word, all that was missing from that rambling was the use of a Venn diagram. (laughs) Well done. How embarrassing. Thanks for the laugh, sad as it is. Stephen writes in about AOC. I just had to take a moment to tell you how much I love when you go after AOC. Well, she makes it so easy, Stephen. Uh, he writes, I may not be the sharpest pencil in the box, but she is absolutely an idiot to keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> okay, we had National Review Day this week. We have different guys from National Review or gals. This week, it was Noah Rothman and MBD. Mary writes, loved the fiery exchange with Noah Rothman on Wednesday's show. I don't always agree with everything on your show, but I listen because you engage in good faith with points of view I don't hear in other places. Tony also writes, love the spicy back and forth between you and Noah from National Review. I appreciate that you appreciated it. We don't always have to agree. It's kind of fun to hear people disagree, right? It's boring if it's always like, yes, I agree. Yes, 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 me too. So we try to bring you uh, different points of view and help keep it a little spicy and a little sweet. A little sweet and spicy, just like yours truly. That's the Megan Kelly Show. I hope you have a great weekend. I'm going to Miami And it's going to get very sweet and spicy there. I'll have a full rundown for you when I come back on Monday. Go ahead and subscribe to the show on YouTube uh, while I have you. YouTube.com slash Megan Kelly. You could be our one million subscriber. Thanks for listening.